Hello, and welcome to The Thin End of the Wedge, the podcast where experts from around the world share new and interesting stories about life in the ancient Middle East. My name's John. Each episode, I talk to friends and colleagues and get them to explain their work in a way we can all understand. We're growing used to the idea that the pre-modern world was more colourful than used to be thought. Classical statues and medieval cathedrals alike were riots of colour. In Mesopotamia, people typically built with mud bricks. But even in this world, colour was everywhere. Scientific techniques now allow us to recover the meagre traces that survive. More than that, though, we know how they interpreted what they saw, what colours they had, as it were. It's not just a case of finding their words for our colours. They classify things differently in the first place. Even more interesting is that we can see the cultural meanings attached to those colours. So we have some understanding of what thoughts would have gone through a Mesopotamian's mind when they saw something blue, for example. Our guest is responsible for a huge advance in our understanding of colour in Mesopotamia. In 2019, her work was recognised with the International Association for Assyriology's Prize for the best PhD dissertation in the field of Assyriology. So get yourself a cup of tea, make yourself comfortable, and let's meet today's guest. Hello, and welcome to Thin End of the Wedge. Thank you for joining us. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us, please, who are you and what do you do? My name is Shanti Thabapalan. I'm an Assyriologist based at the University of Tübingen in Germany. And I research ancient crafts and technologies and semantics, which is a branch of linguistics which deal with the meaning of words and how they change over time. When you visit an archaeological site, you encounter a sea of yellowy-brown. And when you visit a museum, with rare and spectacular exceptions, you seem to see mostly brown or grey objects. Was ancient Mesopotamia a more colourful place? Yes, a lot more colourful. And the colours were a lot more brilliant and vivid than you would imagine, given that the only colour artefacts that have survived are often faded away. So you have to imagine that private buildings and public buildings were often painted, sometimes both inside and out. On the outside, you could have something as simple as a lime wash. On the inside, you could have, if it was a palace, for instance, you could have sophisticated murals painted by master craftsmen. You know, around the second half of the second millennium BCE, the exteriors of palaces and temples were glazed with these huge brick facades. And these are a little bit like Roman mosaics. Sometimes they could be figurative or they could have ornamental designs. Mesopotamian art was very colorful too, and often multimedia. Stone objects could have faience or glass inlays or metallic elements. Ivories, which were used to decorate furniture, were stained in brilliant colors like red and blue and yellow. Textiles were brilliantly colored too. The wool was dyed in shades of red, pink, blue, yellow, brown, purple, black, all the colors really. And they were embroidered or woven into these beautiful patterns. They could also have beading or metallic sequins. People wore cosmetics, sometimes combined with perfumes. People wore brilliant jewelry. But the problem is that all these colors are really fragile. Unfortunately, the humid climate means that organic materials like textiles and dyed leather have disintegrated. And this is too bad because this is what the Mesopotamians were famous for, their textiles. A lot of Mesopotamian architecture is made out of mud brick, but over time, the brick shrinks away from the plaster coating that would have paintings, for instance. And then the lime plaster just pops off and falls to the ground and crumbles away. Paint is really sensitive to things like humidity, light, and pollutants. Some paints are more stable than others. For instance, you often see red and black that survives in paintings, and that's because these are 
very stable pigments. The carbon, the black, and the red ochres are quite stable. Metal objects like sculptures of bronze and copper have been looted and melted and recycled. The glazed brick facades have survived, but their colors have been chemically altered. So, for instance, there are these beautiful ceramic vessels from the city of Asher from the second millennium, and everybody knows them because of their brilliant greenish background body colors and the designs on them. But all those greens were actually blue in ancient time. Glass objects like drinking vessels and bowls and things often have these weathered iridescence on it. All this lost information presents a real challenge for curators of museums to present the Mesopotamian world in color. What colors did Mesopotamians see? Color really isn't in light or in objects. Objects reflect certain wavelengths of light, which we perceive and interpret as colors. Now, humans can see in a very narrow range. This is called the visible light spectrum. We can't see infrared light or ultraviolet light. We can't see X-rays or gamma rays. There are some animals that can. The actual seeing part of color is done with our eyes and with our brains. Human beings have trichromatic vision. This means that we have three light-sensitive receptors called cone cells in the retina. This is a thin membrane on the back of our eyeballs. And these cone cells regulate how we see color in the daylight. We have one cone cell for blue, one for green, and one for red. Our brain interprets colors based on the signals sent by these photoreceptors. So for example, if we look at a yellow object, both red and green cone cells are activated and send signals to our brains. Now there are some animals that see the world in color very differently. Bees and butterflies, for instance, have four cone cells. So they see a much broader spectrum of colors and they can also see ultraviolet colors. And apparently the mantis shrimp, now don't ask me how scientists know this, but the mantis shrimp has 16 color receptive cone cells. This means that they are 10 times more sensitive to color than human beings. What I want to say with all of this is how we see color is more or less the same as how the Mesopotamians would have seen colors a few thousand years ago. But, and here's the thing, how the mind conceives of color as a sensory experience, which aspects we pay attention to, how we encode this experience using language, using art, how we categorize color, group them into sequences, all these things are culturally primed. So I take it that you are a native English speaker, am I right? Yeah, that's right. My native language is Tamil. Now in both our languages, there's an abstract word for color. For us, color is more or less defined based on four qualities. Hue, so that's whether something is red or green, for instance. Brightness, how light or dark something is. Saturation, how pure the hue is. And tone how much white or black a color contains. This is how we define color. It doesn't really matter when we're describing color, whether an object is animate or inanimate, whether it has a particular texture or pattern, but decades of research by cognitive linguists have shown that this is not really true of all languages. The Dani people in New Guinea, for instance, when they describe color, they include qualities like softness or glossiness. People who speak the Hanuno language in the Philippines, for them, it's really important whether an object is dry or kind of wet or succulent. What about Akkadian? Well, color for Akkadian speakers was a part of the characteristic qualities of the things in the world, what they saw around them. Sometimes they described it as the skin or as the face of an object. They could also use things like similes and metaphors to describe color. We do this too. So for instance, they describe one stone as looking like the neck of the tortoise. So here you see both hue and patterns are part of the color language. There's another description of a stone, probably a pearl, as looking like the stork's neck. So probably an iridescence is what's being referred to here. How they spoke about color tells us about which qualities of color they paid attention to and appreciated. 
My work has shown that, for instance, they were fascinated with the contrast of different hues and the changeability of color in different light and in different angles. The other thing is that the quality of brightness was really important. So words like dim, dark, dazzling, shining, translucent, these were part of the regular color vocabulary. Now for us, this sounds strange because dark is an adjective that we use to describe a color. You could have something that's dark red or light blue, right? So let's try and summarize with an example. So John, imagine that I gave you three marbles. One marble is light blue, the other marble is dark blue, and the third is green. I'm going to ask you to divide these into two groups by color. How would you do that? Well, I'd instinctively put the blues together in one pile and the green in another. Exactly. That's how most English speakers would do it because hue is the most important category of color for us. When we categorize color, we prioritize it over other qualities. But for an Acadian speaker, whether something was light or dark was more important. Now, let's say I give you a black marble. Where would you put that marble? Hmm, that's a tricky one. <laughs> I might put it with a dark blue one. It depends how dark your green one is, though. Yeah, that's what the Mesopotamians would, too. They would put it in the dark category. So they would separate the dark blue on one side and the black would belong into this category, too, and the light blue and the green in the other. So even though the Mesopotamians saw color in the same way as we do, their color vocabulary focuses on different qualities of color. How do we know about ancient color? Well, we can answer this question based on many kinds of ancient evidence that we have. I've already told you a little bit about the particularities of the Akkadian color language. But then we have these wonderful recipe texts, for instance. These are step-by-step -step instructions of how craftsmen exploited minerals and plants and animal matters to make color. The glass recipes are the best of all. They tell us how glass makers experimented with adding various kinds of metallic ores like lead, copper, cobalt, manganese, iron, into melting silica in order to create these brilliant colors in faience and glass. And they even were able to manipulate the tones and shades of color by, for instance, varying the amount of lead or changing the atmosphere inside the glass making furnace. Then we have things like day-to-day -day documents, work orders and receipts. And these kind of documents give us the nitty gritty details about the production and circulation of colorful objects. We could learn, for instance, about how dyers and painters acquired their raw materials how much they used for a particular project, how much it cost, how they traded it. Then we have the evidence of objects themselves. There's been a lot of chemical analysis done on paint, on glass, frit and faience, for instance, to see what kind of ingredients, what kind of raw materials were used to make these objects and where exactly the color was coming from. Experimental archaeology allows us to recreate some of these decorative techniques to see how did they get that pattern? How did they paint these? How did they get these woven designs on glass bowls, for instance? And then we have the question of how the Mesopotamians assigned meaning to color. And here again, we need both the texts and the objects. We know, for instance, that the Mesopotamians were very fond of making amulet necklaces with shells, stones, and metal beads. But there are also magical texts that tell us exactly in which sequence to string these beads. And certain sequences protected you against certain things or were a cure against certain diseases. There are also omen texts. And these can tell us how specific features of observed natural phenomena, like the colors of the rainbows or the clouds on a particular day, could be interpreted as messages from the gods. So there are tons of ways of looking at this question. What was the relationship between materials and colours? Well, today we experience colours as abstract, individual, limitless. Colours are not really bound to materials. They're infinitely combinable. We can reproduce them in large quantities in pure states. 
With a projector, for example, we can produce a swatch of yellow color that covers an entire wall. And the swatch, no matter where you look, will be unvarying in hue and tone or saturation. These kinds of pure abstracted expressions of color were not common in Mesopotamia and certainly not easy to produce. Colors were experienced through real world materials. So the materiality of colorful substances, the sheen, the reflectivity, the patterns, the combination of colors, textures, even smells associated with these objects shaped ideas about those colors themselves. So ideas about colors were bound up with materials. The colors of precious minerals like lapis lazuli and carnelian could index ideas like exotic, expensive, rare, or royal. Psychologists call this priming. Even in English, things are not very different. Think about gold. It's really difficult to think of the color gold without linking it to ideas of luxury or superiority. Another particular aspect of the Mesopotamian color sense is that they enjoyed colors and intricate combinations and patterns rather than individually. So if you look at Assyrian and Babylonian fashion, the colorful parts are these woven or embroidered pieces. Blue and red, for instance, was a really popular combination. And like in many cultures, the fashion designers took their inspiration for their designs from the colors and patterns that they found in nature of precious stones, shells, and metals. So it's really unsurprising that the names for these substances was also an important part of the Akkadian language. Where did they get their pigments from? Mesopotamians mainly used earth pigments. So these are pigments that you can get from rocks and stones and clay. If they use lake pigments, so things that come from berries, things like beetroot, plant material like madder or pomegranate skins, these kind of things haven't really been detected in the archaeological record. But that may be because they simply haven't survived. But anyway, there were a few earth pigments that were really commonly used because they were locally available. This includes yellow and red ochre, which you can get from clay that was available everywhere by the riverside. If the clay was rich in iron, it would be more reddish. This was called hematite. Alternatively, you can also take yellow clay and heat it to make it red. They produced white pigments with chalk, which is calcium carbonate, this you can get from limestone, which was again locally available. You could make white with gypsum as well. Black, again, was very easy because you could just make black pigment out of charcoal or burnt bone or soot. Blue, on the other hand, was a bit tricky because there are not many natural substances, minerals or earth that is a vivid blue. So the Mesopotamians basically synthetically produced their own blue pigment. Uh, we call this pigment Egyptian blue, but um, the Mesopotamians probably invented it first. And Egyptian blue is basically made by melting silica alkali, which you can get from certain kind of plants that grow in salty environments and calcium. And then you add a little bit of copper to it. It's this copper that gives it this blue color. So you take this glass melt, you let it cool and you grind it down purify it, and then you get this blue pigment. Now, the color of Egyptian blue can vary. It can be kind of a light pale blue or this royal blue. You can vary the color by changing the way you heat the melt, by grinding it more finely, or by changing the thickness of the application of the paint. There were a few other pigments that were probably imported, things like cinnabar which was a beautiful red, or pigment, a bright golden yellow, and other lead-based pigments. It's not really clear where the Mesopotamians got these pigments from because this information hasn't been recorded in any textual records, but it's very likely that they came from Iran because these pigments occur with other minerals that we know were imported from Iran. But then when we're talking about paint, it's not enough to just think about pigments because in order to make paint, you have to mix it with a whole bunch of other ingredients. And we don't really know in which proportions the Mesopotamians mixed these materials and which materials they actually used. 
So to make paint, you need what's called a binder. This is what holds everything together. Mesopotamians probably used animal glue for this, but it's also possible to use gum Arabic, so any kind of plant gum or egg yolk or even different kinds of oils. But again, because of the humidity, these materials have disintegrated, so we don't really know which binder they used. Then aside from that, you need something to keep the paint moist. This is called a humectant. You can use honey for this, but we don't know if that's what they did. You need an emulsifier to give the paint a little bit of volume and liquid, something like water or vinegar would work. And you need something to decrease the viscosity of all these materials. So Mesopotamian craftsmen probably had different kinds of recipes and probably different groups of craftsmen had their own secret recipes for making various paints. And sometimes, you know, even a red paint could have two different pigments, two different kinds of red pigments mixed together to produce a particular shade. We don't really have a lot of this information, unfortunately. What about purple? As far as I could see, they did that by layering blue and red. So at Yale, we have these Assyrian reliefs, and you know these genie figures have these wonderful sandals and the sandals look like they're painted red but again that's because it's only the red paint that survived but when we did the egyptian blue test with infrared light this visible induced light photography there was blue pigment on top of it except so much of it had just fallen off that couldn't really see the purpley effect anymore so i think there the idea was to have purple sandals have you experimented? I mean, have you tried to make paints from these materials? I tried this in a workshop when I was at Brown last year, and I couldn't get a lot of the pigments because they get quite expensive, and it takes a long time to make the pigments. So I chose the ochres, yellow and red ochre, and I used cinnabar, malachite, and a few other pigments, and I tried it with my students using different kinds of binders, so animal glue, egg yolk, and we used linseed oil and honey. And we tried to make oil paints, to make watercolor paints, to make glue-based paints, and we tried them. And it makes such a huge difference because also depending on what you're painting, whether it's stone or whether it's a piece of wood or paper. For instance, if you don't add the right proportions of the honey or the oil, your paint will never dry. Or if you don't add enough of them, your paint becomes really dry. And as you touch your hand on it, it'll just come off. So it's really complicated. <laughs> I imagine it also makes a difference what sort of climate you're in. If you have a dry environment, it makes a big difference for your paint. And the other thing that we realized is that you have to constantly have a way to keep your materials heated. So if you're using animal glue, you have to have a small fire to keep it heated. Otherwise, you can't really keep making paint and work. So there must have been a whole setup that each of these little working groups must have had. What did colours mean in Mesopotamia? Oh, that's such a complicated question. Well, simply put, a lot. The colours of a decorated room could evoke feelings of luxury and harmony. The colors of a beautifully made up woman could make her look sexy, irresistible, dangerous even. There's this wonderful poem about the love goddess Ishtar from the second millennium BCE, in which she's described as clothed in charm. She is adorned with seductiveness, cosmetics, and appeal. Her colors are beautiful, her eyes shimmering and iridescent. Then there are things like scientific texts, and here, Color was thought to be a key part of the external appearance of things. And through the colors, you could identify a material's inherent properties. And there were some people, experts, who were especially knowledgeable about these matters, and they could read these signs, which could reveal how human beings could exploit these materials for their purposes, to cure diseases or prevent disasters. In medicine, for instance, just like today, color was a key part of diagnosing diseases. Physicians came up with spectrums to chart normal and abnormal symptoms. My favorite is the urine color scale. They had a color scale to describe all the possible colors of your urine and 
what the symptom could mean. So they had red, wine colored, pale yellow green, black, like water, dark, tamarind juice colored, glue colored, milky, cloudy and thick, and yellow leather colored. Now I'll let you guess which colors were not so great. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I'd like to emphasize is that when you experience colors in built spaces, this experience was synesthetic, which means that different senses work together to create a kind of multi-sensory experience. What do I mean by this? Well, think about the cinema. When you go to watch a film, you know that sight and sound work together. The barriers between these two senses are broken down. And when you have a really good cinematic experience, there's a harmony between these senses. So if you want to talk about the meaning of color on a Syrian sculpture, for example, and these sculptures, as you know, were placed inside the rooms of palaces. This is not just a visual experience. They have to be experienced in the kind of flickering, soft, yellowish, glowing firelight that lit up the rooms of these palaces. When you look up, you would have seen the upper parts of the walls and ceilings and columns all covered in these wonderful painted ornamental designs. But you also wouldn't have been able to see everything. Imagine a kind of theater of reflections and shadows. This is where the beauty of color lay and how it interacts with the light. And there are other design elements of the reliefs that deliberately were chosen to create a sense of animation. The colors enliven the figures. And then you have these repetitive motifs that make you move forward, that draws the view onwards, encasing him in a kind of infinity. There were smells, perfumed oils, incense the smell of different kinds of polished wood. There were sounds of people, music, animals, diffused in some areas, maybe with textiles or more manifest in others, like in the open courtyards. So the Mesopotamian sensorial experience was synesthetic, but it was also active and projective. Beautiful materials, like I've been talking about, could heal, they could be intoxicating, they could protect you. When the Assyrian kings talk about the effect of the colorful palaces that they build, they say that they built these palaces for their lordly pleasure and that they created awesome wonder among the people of the land. How can we follow your work? Well, you can follow my work through academia.edu. I put up my published articles on this website and several of these are aimed at a more general audience. So they're things like museum catalogs and general readership works. So this is a good place to start. And if anyone wants more detail, you do have a book on the subject, don't you? Yes, I just published a book called The Meaning of Colour in Ancient Mesopotamia. I mean, it promises quite a lot, but uh, I will start with the conclusion and then see where you want to go. What are you working on now? My current research is a little bit related to what I did before, but it's about the idea of imitations. So when I worked on color, I realized that one of the reasons that the color vocabulary expands in Mesopotamia is because of all these technologies for producing and imitating colors. So now I'm looking at the larger idea of mimicry and imitation in Mesopotamian thought. And I want to try and figure out what does this do to a society? What does it mean when you have objects that are reproduced, imitated, mimicked? What does it mean when you have authentic things and things that are supposedly fakes or knockoffs? Is there a division between these things? Was there a division between natural things and man-made things? How do Mesopotamians deal with these changes and challenges in their material culture? Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'd also like to thank our patrons, Tyler Russell, Enrique Jimenez, Haida Orakabi, Jana Matushak, Nancy Highcock, JC, Runa Rattenborg, Woodthrush, Elisa Horsberger, Mark Whedon, Jordi Mon Companies, Thomas Bolin, Joan Porter McGeever, John McGuinness, Andrew George, and Elena Rockich. I really appreciate your support. It makes a big difference. And thank you for listening to Thin End of the Wedge. If you enjoy what we do, please consider supporting us via Patreon. That's patreon.com 
forward slash wedge pod. Even a couple of pounds a month helps keep the podcast going and brings us closer to the point where we can make proper translations into Middle Eastern languages. You can also support us in other ways. Simply subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a five-star review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Recommend us to your friends. Follow us on Twitter at wedge underscore pod. If you want the latest podcast news, you can sign up for our newsletter. You can find all the links in the show notes and on our website at wedgepod.org. W-E-D-G-E-P-O-D dot org. Thanks, and I hope you'll join us next time.